Welcome everyone. My name is Kim Newcomer. I'm the Senior Manager of Medical Advocacy and Community Engagement at the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Today we're going to talk about health and wellness. Uh, we have an amazing group of panelists, including Dr. Sandish Rao, uh, Cynthia Thompson, and uh, Tari Prinster. And first up, we have Dr. Standish Rao, who is a Medical Director of Supportive Oncology, the Medical Director of Integrative Oncology at the James C. Fox Foundation Center for Cancer Prevention and Integrative Oncology, Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you for letting me speak today. I'm Santosh Rao. I'm a medical oncologist and a integrative oncologist. I work at Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center in Gilbert, Arizona, where I am the medical director of supportive oncology and the medical director of integrative oncology and a practicing medical oncologist. I'm also the president-elect for the Society for Integrative Oncology. Today, we're going to be talking about integrative oncology and the need for whole person cancer care. First of all, let's take a step back and look at some of the causes of cancer. We know that cancer is caused by a combination of host factors, which may come in the form of your genetic predisposition, and then epigenetics, which is how genetics and gene uh, expression are modified. Then there are endogenous factors, which include hormonal influences, cytokines, immunity, and the microbiome. We also have a number of external in, uh, insults, which can cause environmental factors, such as radiation, toxins, or pathogens. And then there's energy balance, which uh, can get influenced through diet and lifestyle factors. And we know that there's a progression from a risk of developing cancer to the actual development of cancer. Most of us have learned the hallmarks of cancer, which were updated in 2011. And briefly, there are a number of factors that contribute to the development and proliferation of cancer. Interestingly, in 2011, there were these four uh, additional factors that were added. Two of them are enabling characteristics, which are genomic instability and mutation and tumor-promoting inflammation, and then deregulation of cellular energetics and avoidance of immune destruction. All of these factors add to what we considered hallmarks of cancer and are modifying factors in a sense that add to the idea of lifestyle and other influences in the development of cancer. This is a map of some of the influences on, of lifestyle on all these various factors uh, of the hallmarks of cancer. And this is by far not exhaustive, but you can get a sense that obesity, which is a common uh, cause of cancer or is often implicated at least, has multiple areas where it can influence the hallmarks of cancer. We know that inflammation has links with obesity, stress, whether you exercise or are sedentary, as well as the microbiome, all of which can influence the tumor microenvironment. Genomic instability has been shown to be involved uh, and increased with age. Uh, it can be influenced by stress and a lack of exercise. In addition, deregulating uh, cellular energetics and avoidance of immune destruction, as mentioned, were added as uh, emerging hallmarks in the hallmarks of cancer. Deregulation of cellular energetics is impacted by obesity, and avoidance of immune destruction is promoted by aging, stress, lack of exercise, obesity, as well as influences from the microbiome. So this is a broad range of different influences that we're starting to learn more about that can influence cancer and its behavior. So what is integrative oncology? This is a definition that has been promoted by the Society for Integrative Oncology, and it's one that we all accept. Integrative oncology is a patient-centered, evidence-informed field of cancer care that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products, and or lifestyle modifications from different traditions alongside conventional cancer treatments. Integrative oncology aims to optimize health, quality of life, and clinical outcomes across the cancer care continuum and to empower people to become active participants before, during, and beyond cancer treatment. This is not an easy thing to define because it's very broad. And basically the things that really identify integrative oncology as a field that hopefully has broad acceptance is first of all, it's patient-centered. Most patients you know, want to feel in some sense of control over their disease and what they can do to influence their care and the outcomes. 
And we give them tools to become active participants, which is obviously very important when somebody's going through the cancer journey. I think the other thing that's uh, unique about integrative oncology is this idea of, of adopting and, and using different traditions and different forms of allied health and complementary care alongside conventional care. Specifically, it's not uh, alternative at all. It's complementary, but you're using all the different healers and healthcare providers that many of our patients take advantage of, and you're bringing them into the system in an evidence-informed and evidence-based fashion to try to coordinate care and influence symptoms and general uh, uh, wellness while somebody's going through cancer care. So why is this important? We know that a majority of cancer patients use some form of complementary therapies, as much as 80%, depending on how you define complementary therapies. And unfortunately, many do not disclose this to physicians. And this is due to a variety of factors. Many patients don't feel their, uh, their physicians will accept their use of complementary therapies. Many times it's just time or the fact that somebody doesn't ask. It's a major business that's often not well-regulated, especially natural products is definitely becoming more popular in cancer care. And it's important for us to have some skill in knowing how to navigate when it's to be used, how it's to be used, and how to coordinate it. And that takes some expertise and uh, understanding of the literature. The evidence is growing on the potential impact on symptom management and quality of life, as well as cost savings. And I'll uh, show you a few guidelines in the future. And then safety issues are there as well. There's confusing mes me messages, and many patients will shop on the internet. Um, you know, many times it influences compliance with conventional care, and we know that those who pursue alternative medicine do worse in general. As, and there are also potentials for herb-drug interactions. Generally speaking, patients come in with their own values and cultural expectations. We have our best evidence and our clinical expertise, and we try to meet in the middle and help patients uh, develop a plan that's personalized to them, but also fits with their own cultural and personal beliefs and how they want to go through things as well. I think this kind of personalized approach, in addition to evidence-based care, is the best way to help a patient personalize their own journey. So what is an integrative oncology consult? On the right is a model that comes from MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in Houston, looking at physical, psychospiritual, and social health as all uh, important factors in uh, one's health as they go through cancer. And you can see all the different uh, modalities that we can use to help uh, somebody uh, manage their health as they're going through this journey. Many of them are what we would consider integrative, including music therapy, Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, integrative oncology consults, and many of them are conventional. During our meetings, we usually have a one-hour initial meeting and we assess diet, physical activity, stress, sleep, spirituality, and the use of natural products and complementary therapies. And then we tailor specific needs individually and utilize our own resources in our program as well as in the community. We try to coordinate care with other providers, the judicious use of complementary therapies when it should or should not be used, and then we guide evidence-based integrative care without promoting alternative care. A lot of times it's answering questions. We all have patients who come in with a long list of potential supplements they wanna take, and we help answer those questions and guide them accordingly. So what are some of the recommendations? These are basic recommendations. <clears throat> The uh, American Cancer Society guidelines on nutrition and physical activity for cancer prevention promote a healthy body weight, 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity, or 75 minutes of vigorous activity, physical exercise. We say at least five servings of fruits and vegetables per day, maybe five to nine. I do think that we often lump fruits and vegetables together, and maybe we should not always do that. Um, choosing whole grains in preference to refined uh, grains, limiting red and processed meats, something that we're learning more about, and then limiting alcohol as well. Some very interesting things that we talk about in integrative oncology, one of them is the microbiome, which is definitely emerging as a uh, variable in cancer um, the, today in terms of the uh, cause of cancer as well as behavior. One of the interesting things that has been uh, published recently by Jennifer McQuaid from MD Anderson is that probiotics, which are often used by many of our patients, can adversely affect response to immunotherapy. And it's thought that it reduces the diversity of microbiomes, um, which can somehow influence 
the response to immunotherapy. So this has a real influence on outcomes potentially. One of the interesting things is that it's been shown that fecal transplants in mouse models uh, may ha have an impact on cancer growth. And the microbiome can be modified by diet, antibiotics, as we all know, and other factors. We know that exercise can affect survival. This is a study that was published in JCO in 2006 after a colorectal cancer diagnosis showing that physical activity greatly uh, adjusted uh, healthcare outcomes in colorectal cancer, specific mortality as well as overall mortality. It's not necessarily a causative relationship, it's an association, but we know that physical activity is a very important factor in one's uh, outcomes after diagnosis and, uh, and hopefully within survivorship as well. Stress uh, has an influence on cancer. We don't necessarily say stress causes cancer and stress is not always easy to define. It influences behavior and it's often subjective as well. But, you know, we, we think of maladaptive stress causing uh, hormonal changes, increasing cortisol and insulin, uh, which has certain effects on, on cancer potentially as well. It can cause immunosuppression, vascular changes. I mentioned maladaptive behaviors, as well as mood changes like depression which all can have an influ influence on uh, the tumor microenvironment as well as cytokines as shown in this picture. We use various methods uh, as shown here to reduce stress, exercise, yoga, tai chi, psycho-oncology, focus a lot on sleep, which tends to be a problem for many uh, individuals going through cancer, mindfulness, meditation, guided imagery, all the things that we think of that uh, are really evidence-based, but also very safe and helpful for patients going through this. Sleep, as I mentioned, is incredibly impactful and can be caused by so many different things that, uh, that we give patients, including medications. Pain can influence sleep, depression, anxiety, uh, or it could be somebody who has chronic sleep disturbances and it's exacerbated through the diagnosis. And we use a personalized approach Recently, there's a paper that showed that you can try to personalize the approach from an integrative standpoint. If somebody has co, uh, comorbid uh, anxiety, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy may be the best approach. Whereas if there's pain uh, associated with insomnia, acupuncture has some benefit as well. Um, and then there's various different uh, findings that I wanted to just kind of pinpoint. We know that increased animal inf fat intake has uh, been shown to increase the risk of colon and breast cancer. Acupuncture improves um, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. It has an influence on neuropathy, arthralgias from hormonal therapy for breast cancer, pain and fatigue. We know that people providers who have some personal experience with exercise tend to recommend it more to patients. And I do think it's helpful, and many of our trainees and medical students nowadays are getting personal uh, uh, experience with many of these complementary modalities, so they have a sense of, uh, of how it feels and can talk about it with patients. Yoga has been shown to help with hot flashes and peripheral neuropathy. Massage can reduce pain and anxiety. And mindfulness stress reduction has been shown to help with acute pain. The Society for Integrative Oncology has helped put together multiple guidelines. I've shown a few here. One of the latest ones is in uh, breast cancer, and we're working on one in uh, pain right now. These have been uh, very helpful to help uh, show what the evidence is for different integrative uh, therapies. In terms of information, um, there's many websites. These are some of my favorites uh, beyond conventional cancer therapy. The Society for Integrative Oncology has its own website with a lot of information. We have a podcast called Integrative Oncology Talk. Um, there's a great website at Memorial Sloan Kettering about supplements, which I often recommend. Um, and you can see the rest there. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you for joining me today, and I'll be joining you at the end of this uh, uh, panel to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Rao. And now um, on to Dr. Cynthia Thompson, who's a professor and director at Canyon Ranch Center for Prevention and Health Promotion, Health Promotion Science Department, the University of Arizona. Hello, my name is Cindy Thompson, and I am a registered dietitian working in oncology services, as well as an oncology researcher and a colorectal cancer survivor. And I'd like to take just a few minutes today to update you on where we are in terms of diet and colorectal cancer. 
As many of you know, we are exposed as humans to all kinds of items that are in our environment that affect how we prosper in our world. And in fact, when we think about colorectal cancer, this human exposome, as we call it, can really drive our cancer risk. So here what I do is show you some general external factors such as socioeconomic status, climate, stress, social capital that affect our health, as well as specific external factors that are associated with colorectal cancer and the internal environment. And you will see that in yellow, I've highlighted all of the factors that interact with the food that we eat and alter our risk for colorectal cancer. In addition, it's important to realize that we get exposed to these items throughout our lifetime and even in utero. And so when we think about colorectal cancer and diet, while diet is a key factor, it's interplaying with a number of other exposures that affect our health. The most important thing to think about when it comes to diet and colorectal cancer is the fact that our gut interacts with the external environment and that everything we eat interacts with our gut. And so I'm going to go through some slides today, but at the end of the day, think about the fact that we know a Western diet can affect our health detrimentally in terms of colorectal cancer. And it is the high intake of red and processed meats, low fiber intake, and high fat intake that particularly may alter the gut microbiome in a way that produces mucosal inflammation and in turn leads to systemic inflammation that can drive our risk of colorectal cancer. We also know that most cancers, or many, 14 now, are associated with obesity, and obesity is an inflammatory state. It is estimated that about 38.4% of colorectal cancer is associated with obesity, and this is higher than most other cancers. And so maintaining a healthy body weight is a big part of reducing our risk and improving our survival after colorectal cancer. There are a number of mechanisms by which obesity can lead to cancer progression. And these include not only the inflammation that I talked about, but also DNA repair, changes in our hormone levels, clearance of carcinogens, the way cells divide and grow, as well as insulin resistance. And diet, as well as physical activity, can help to interplay to reduce this risk. And I want to point out that obesity is not as simple as looking at your weight or looking at your body mass index. And in fact, what we're finding is that there are a number of people who have a healthy body weight, but in turn, when we look at their actual levels of circulating glucose and insulin um, and C-reactive protein, a marker of inflammation, even normal weight people who are low physical activity and who eat a lower quality diet and sometimes just genetically are prone to insulin resistance can have a increased risk of colorectal cancer cancer because they're metabolically unhealthy. And in fact, in this one study of 5,000 postmenopausal women, we found that 34% of them were metabolically unhealthy, even though they had a healthy body weight. So it's really important to find out what is your fasting glucose? What is your uh, high density lipoproteins? Do you have signs of metabolic imbalance? so that you can address these issues through a healthier eating pattern. And sometimes just a five to 10% body weight loss can markedly improve these markers. So what can we recommend in terms of dietary habits and the food we eat? Well, we know that there's evolving evidence that calcium and vitamin D may prevent colorectal cancer or play a role. These data are not always 100% in agreement. 
But overall, the indication is that these are key nutrients to keep our guts healthy. And in fact, these are nutrients that may be hard to get in adequate amounts in our diet. So it's not uncommon for individuals at risk or survivors of colorectal cancer to consume calcium or vitamin D supplements. Vegetables and fruits are also critical. And I don't have time today to go into all the individual vegetables and fruits that may be advantageous, but I would tell you that eating a variety of colors, flavors, and even those cruciferous vegetables that can cause gas are really important for colorectal cancer prevention. In addition, dietary patterns matter. So eating an overall diet that's lower in fat, higher in fruits and vegetables, higher in fiber, has diversity and is anti-inflammatory is very important. And in fact, one of the diet patterns that is frequently promoted in this regard is the Mediterranean diet as well as other anti-inflammatory diets. These are diets that are obviously higher in healthy fats, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, fish and seafood, low fat dairy, low fat poultry, eggs, with less or no meat intake and limited alcohol intake and don't forget the physical activity as well as lots of daily water consumption. Now I wanna mention that there's a trend where early onset colorectal cancer, and that's what I had, are affecting more and more individuals. This is when you're diagnosed before the age of 45 when we start screening. Early life exposures related to diet are thought to be one factor that's driving this trend in increased risk of cancer at younger ages. And some of you may remember the invention of more and more processed foods, TV dinners, processed meats, refined grains, and high fructose corn syrup. It's really important to understand that while we can't do anything about what we ate as we grew up, we can definitely set new patterns for our children and we can change our diets now in a way that promotes a healthy colon. Processed and red meats obviously have been a major instigator in terms of colorectal cancer risk and survival. And I just wanna point out that there's also emerging evidence that it's not just eating the foods, but how we prepare these foods. These foods, when you heat them, in high heat, dry heat, what will happen is advanced glycation end products will form, which are known to be carcinogens. And these particularly form from our higher animal-based diet. So remember, when you are thinking about red and processed meats, first of all, you want to limit them as much as possible. But if you do decide to eat these foods, make sure that you're not cooking them under high heat and dry heat. We wanna make sure that we do what we can to reduce our exposure to these through less fry, frying, less high temperature roasting, baking, grilling, or charring. And one way you can counteract this is to marinate these meats in acidic marinades, such as orange juice or lemon juice or lime juice. The American Cancer Society has set guidelines for nutrition and cancer survival. And these include maintaining a healthy body weight, being physically active, eating that diet high in plant foods and whole grains, avoiding processed meats and avoiding alcohol. So these are very consistent with what we've heard about colon cancer and diet. We also know that when we look at individuals who follow these ACS guidelines, they have not only lower risk for colorectal cancer, but a much higher um, death rate or mortality related to colorectal cancer. So make sure that you think about this in terms of your overall health and well-being going forward. I also always like to remind people that there are a lot of anti-inflammatory seasonings out there. You can grow them yourself or you can um, purchase them at the store. And these are wonderful additions to our palate. In summary, colorectal has stronger associations with what we eat than any other cancer. 
eating pattern should avoid red and processed meats, increase fruits and vegetables, and improve your metabolic health. Think about cooking methods and integrating spices, and a reminder to stay physically active. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cynthia Thompson. Next up is Tari Prinster. Tari is a cancer survivor, master yoga teacher, celebrated author and founder of Yoga for Cancer and the Yoga for Cancer Foundation, which brings oncology yoga to cancer survivors worldwide. Hello, greetings, welcome. I am Tari Prinster, founder of Yoga for Cancer and also a cancer survivor. I welcome you here today uh, to tell you a little bit about my program, Yoga for Cancer, that I started nearly 20 years ago when I was a cancer patient myself. At the time, being told, diagnosed, I was a little bit overwhelmed and I wanted to be an active participant in my treatment program. Uh, and I looked around and saw that there were very few ways that I could do that. And certainly there was not a program like the one I will talk to you about today um, available. So I have since then organized a methodology that has served numerous cancer patients and survivors worldwide, and also have trained more than well, thousands, more than 3,000 yoga teachers and healthcare professionals who are bringing this methodology to many, many, many more cancer patients and survivors. Uh, but I want to talk to you specifically today about what your role is uh, in um, as, as a patient and survivor and how you can impact your health and prognosis. I also want to point out some research on oncology yoga that can be helpful to you and give you some very specific suggestions on how to make secure your long-term survivorship. So the first suggestion I'm going to make is you have a new job. Your job as a cancer patient um, is new, but you also, if you are a long-term survivor, you have a job. And that job is to manage the side effects that are anticipated and sometimes unanticipated from your treatments. Your job also is to maintain daily functioning. And sometimes those side effects can get in the way of maintaining that functioning. And another part, another task of your job is to achieve treatment protocols. That means to finish your treatments. So how do we do that? Well, to achieve all of that, manage treatments, you need to be physically strong. You need to be physically strong and flexible. In addition, you also need to be resilient, emotionally resilient to the challenges that you may face as a cancer patient and even as a long-term survivor. And in addition, you need to be aware and stay active about managing long-term side effects, which come with risks. So what are those side effects? The side effects for colorectal cancer are, for the most part, very similar to those of most cancers. Anxiety, fatigue, Treatments sometimes cause chemo brain. There can be weight gain and weight loss. And certainly bone loss is one of the very quiet uh, side effects from most cancer treatments. Range of motion and long-term scar tissue as a result of, of, of surgeries can also be a, a side effect for colorectal cancer patients and survivors. Not to mention the psychological stigma and even the adjustments to daily hygiene routine are very, very common and critical to colorectal cancer survivors, along with abdominal lymphedema. Other considerations are management of weight gain, being active, and eating healthy. Now, these are the side effects. Um, th these are considerations that are suggested by 
the well-known experts, especially the American Cancer Society, which says and gives us help to get through your new job. That these are guidelines that have they have prescribed that exist to support you in your new job. And specifically, they recommend at least 150 minutes of moderate exercise every week. Now, in that list of what is moderate exercise, active yoga is included and recommended. Sadly, nearly 70% of cancer survivors are not achieving this movement recommendation. However, we are very pleased to say that there is help with your job of doing that. Oncology yoga can be a tool for your new job. Research has shown that oncology yoga builds strength in muscles and bones, improves flexibility and range of motion, reduces anxiety and fatigue, improves lymphatic function, helps manage weight, improves balance, and it also provides quality of life and a sense of well-being. Now, oncology yoga is not any kind of yoga. It is a specific kind of yoga that is designed to address the research that has been unfolded and also to meet the guidelines of the American Cancer Society. There are many kinds of yoga, but there are not all the same. So what we have done is create a evidence-informed form of yoga with specific interventions to manage side effects. It is a yoga that is adaptable to your needs, to your body's changes, and it is safe because it is provided by qualified, certified yoga professionals. And probably most important, it is accessible. It is available to you anytime, anywhere. I want to invite you to join me on the website yoga for cancer y4c.com uh, and here you can take a free class we certainly know and understand that the uh, cancer treatments can be quite costly but you do not have to pay a teacher you do not have you can take a free class online at y4c.com you can also there find a well-trained oncology yoga teacher who has been certified one that is near you through our directory. I encourage you to catch the latest research on our website and, on, and read the blog articles, which you might find very helpful. And of course, I would love for you to look into the book, Yoga for Cancer, which um, I wrote and um, offered to all cancer patients and survivors. Uh, it is in Spanish as well as English and uh, also in Japanese. So thank you for joining me and I hope there are some suggestions here that you will find helpful in your recovery or your continued success as a survivor. Thank you to our three fabulous presenters for your presentations today. They are now going to be here live to answer any questions. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our health and wellness panel. Um, this is something that's very close to my heart and close to a lot of our allies' hearts. So I'm happy to have here with us today, Dr. Stantish Rao, uh, Dr. Cynthia Thompson, and Tari Prinster could not join us today. So we have Josie uh, Keitel will be joining us uh, for our live Q&A today. So we had three very, um, great presentations today. And we have a few questions um, from our audience. And our first question is, are there any specialists that know how to help patients with lower anterior resection syndrome? We tend to uh, get told things that work for other cancer patients, but not uh, uh, for those of us missing a rectum um, and sigmoid. 
and have had radiation to the pelvis. Does anyone wanna take that question about Lars? I can just say, I don't have any specific knowledge. I mean, I think that, you know, this is such a specific question. This is why we develop multidisciplinary teams because it's difficult to know who that one person is and so, you know, part of having a community of caregivers is first at your own facility, you want to work with the colon cancer surgeons, um, find out what's safe, you want to work with occupational physical therapists, and this would be a team approach to developing something personalized to that person. And if you don't have that person who has that kind of knowledge, that's where you reach out to a network and other providers as well. Um, I'm not aware, though, otherwise of any specific, you know, recommendations, obviously. It depends on what somebody's side effects are also from radiation and surgery. Right. And Dr. Thompson, what about nutrition? Are there things that they can eat? Um, we know with rectal and colon cancer, some things are off the table for us. Are there some things we can eat that can help uh, with bars? You know, I don't think there's a lot of uh, quote, published literature, but I did want you to know we have a study through the Southwest Oncology Group called the Altering Intake Managing Symptoms for Rectal Cancer Survivors. And we're evaluating the impact of a health coaching intervention where we kind of use a, an elimination diet approach to try and figure out, as Dr. Rao said, on an individual basis, what is driving some of these symptoms and what can be done to re reverse some of these symptoms. And we do have some survey data that certainly are suggestive of problematic foods. For example, um, dairy foods, um, corn is another one um, for some people, soybeans. So there are some foods that seem to rise to the top that we have to be careful with. Um, unfortunately, several of them are vegetables that we do want people to integrate into their diet in terms of cancer prevention. So we're trying to, um, during this study, really figure out how this individualized health coaching might help to relieve these symptoms and then allow people to reintroduce these foods. And I also want to comment that it's the same for exercise. I think the assumption that colorectal and rectal cancer patients can just go out and start running or walking again or go to curves. And there are a lot of um, symptoms that make it very difficult to be out in public exercising. And um, so again, a, a tailored approach where you gradually increase exercise is much more effective and um, tolerable. And as a long-term can colorectal cancer survivor, you know, we have relapses and that's the world we live in. But I, I think personally, I've been able to manage things over time. Yeah, I notice I, I'm also a stage four uh, rectal cancer survivor. I've seen Dr. Rao and one of the best things, one of my favorite things is I took dairy out of my diet and started using ghee. Um, that really helped my diet. Just finding different alternatives to uh, mm -hmm. foods that you really love um, are great. So um, I'll have a question for Josie. Um, how should someone who's had a APR surgery get back into exercise? And are there any exercises to avoid? So that is uh, a surgery in which the anus, rectum, and sig sigmoid colon are removed. So are there any special exercises you would recommend? Well, I would echo both what Dr. Rao and Dr. Thompson said is one, work with your team to identify when is a good time um, to get back into exercise um, and do things that are um, progressive and modular based on how you f feel in a given day, because um, you might have a really good day and then need a day where you have a little tough. So, um, you know, a lot of what you're trying to do is boost your immune system so that you are you know, really working the digestive system properly and utilizing the best that your body can. So the more you can move and the more you can kind of slowly progressive do different types of movements in that lower torso will probably help your digestive process, but also manage it with lower risk. So that if you have any incision sites or having any challenges, um, uh, then they will be mitigated. I don't yeah, know I think just I think moving is really great for patients. Moving. Like, 
yeah, start slowly, get out of bed, move. I mean, a lot of people don't yeah, understand and realize that a cancer patient and survivor should be getting a minimum of 150 minutes of exercise per week. That's a minimum. If you're carrying any type of weight, which uh, Dr. Thompson talked about very effectively about how weight has a um, predisposition, especially in colorectal cancer. So managing that weight and moving on every given day. And that's why we prefer yoga because it does absolutely can be modified and it can be progressive. So you're having a great day, you can be a little bit more active. If you're having a tough day and having suffering from side effects, whether it's the, the lack of sleep that Dr. Santos said, you can, uh, you know, you can uh, change it as on a given day. So. Right. I think uh, exercise really helps with mental health too. I think if you're up and moving, I feel like that really helps with mental health too. We know a lot of survivors struggle with that. So and there's a lot of research that actually supports that. One of the biggest side effects that cancer patients and survivors face is um, stress and, uh, sorry, fatigue. And that fatigue then spirals into stress and anxiety. And actually a lot of people at first thought, think, oh, you should be sleeping for fatigue. But actually there's a fair amount of research that says the more you move, that is the better, um, uh, better management tool for, um, the, uh, for fatigue. Okay. Well, thank you. And we do have a, a specific research question around hormone replacement in women who have had total radical hysterectomies or surgical menopause due to cancer and how it affects, um, due to cancer and how it affects treatment and outcomes. I know I talk to my doctor about this a lot too. Um, do you guys suggest hormone replacement in women? I mean, I can start with this. I guess this is in the context of colorectal cancer. Yes. I mean, um, you know, it's a complex question because it depends on the symptoms somebody has, how long. Um, I know that, uh, you know, a lot of gynecologists, they will consider short-term hormone replacement therapy um, if there's very, you know, specific symptoms. Or if somebody has vaginal dryness, you might consider um, topical estrogen. Um, I think in the cancer community, one of the things that's, I, and I'm, talking from a breast oncologist, I, I used to be a breast oncologist, you know, there's been a dramatic reduction in the incidence of breast cancer with, you know, less uh, hormone replacement therapy in menopausal women. So I think long-term hormone replacement therapy is not in vogue, although you have to, of course, again, take that individually with the individual and how bad their symptoms are. I'm not myself aware. I mean, there's always uh, implications for estrogen in other cancers. Um, I'm sure there's some basic science around this, but I'm not sure of the specific risk of uh, estrogen replacement therapy in colon cancer. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thomas, there's a question for you. Um, we have someone who says, I'm a vegan and I'm very happy to, be, to have become a vegan uh, two years prior to her colorectal cancer diagnosis. What do you say about the impossible and beyond meats? Are they considered processed foods? <laughs> You know, they, I mean, if you look at the sell by date and you look at the, how long they um, are maintained <laughs> in the refrigerator, yeah, they're, you know, they are processed meats um, per se, perhaps, you know, we could have a scale and say, you know, bologna is worse than this and this is worse than that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I don't think they're an ideal choice. That said, when I'm working with someone who's eating a diet that's meat and potatoes, the impossible meats may be just what I need to get start getting them moving towards a more vegan approach or a more vegetarian approach, a, a plant based diet. So, you know, I think they have their place, but certainly um, they're not at the top of the list of food choices for um, for me. It's like the healthy, unhealthy food. Or <laughs> All right. This is a question about THC. So what is the feeling about edibles like uh, THC gummies and CBD oils and et cetera when in treatment? Um, I can take this one. Okay. I mean, um, I'm a big fan of, of cannabis. Uh, I think that, you know, we're learning more and more about how many symptoms it helps with. And, you know, uh, patients are certainly interested now with uh, many states legalizing it, whether it's recreational or medical, it's becoming a lot more available. I think that this is an area that's become very complicated um, because there's so many choices now. You know, if anybody is curious, go to a medical dispensary 
and it's just really complicated. There's so many different products, it's crazy. And now there are different blends between um, THC and CBD. I think people get the two confused often. Um, you know, THC is what we recommend for appetite, for mood, uh, you know, issues like anxiety, for sleep. Uh, THC tends to be a little bit more effective. CBD has some effect, um, you know, things like that. Whereas uh, CBD can be helpful for pain and, and some other very localized issues, but it's not the same. So, I mean, you have to think about which product the patient needs. The other thing is I'm not a huge fan of gummies. You know, gummies are probably the easiest thing to take, but if you're doing THC, um, you have to get really uh, a good product because otherwise it's very variable in terms of how much THC you get. So there are things like tinctures or lozenges or sprays, those kind of things like that. Um, I don't generally have a problem with using any of these products during therapy. There is some uh, research suggesting that there may be an issue with immunotherapy and uh, either THC or CBD because it modifies the immune system. So we tend to tell people not to use these products during immunotherapy. And can I just add from the gummy perspective, you know, as a nutritionist, sometimes I get concerned that not necessarily for the marijuana project um, products, but with cannabis, people are probably a little more concerned, but, but we do see a lot of people who've gone to gummy vitamins and, and really tend to over consume, um, both in terms of the potential sugar content of these products, as well as some of the nutrients. So you can't just assume because it's in a candy formation, it's safe and that you can eat as much as you want. <laughs> okay. We have a question about um, the fecal transplants. They've been a topic of interest for a few years now. Any ideas on how this might be used in the near future to support microbiome? Cynthia, do you know any more about this than I do? Well, you know, all I would say is that certainly it's highly effective for things like C. difficile, right? And, and kind of correcting problems that are more acute with the gut. I, I don't know how we would use it long term to because your gut is, is a very dynamic organ and it tends to go back to kind of its safe zone where it, that's been set um, throughout life. And so I don't know, you'd have to probably do repeat fecal transplants if you wanted to have like this specific microbiome. You also have to remember that, you know, these fecal transplants aren't your, so you're gonna adapt to them as a host um, in various ways. So I, I'm more a fan of eating a diet that's more anti-inflammatory and getting a, a routine down in terms of your um, gut health that's driven by food rather than fecal transplants. I mean, I, I think that this gets back to some open-ended questions about what influence the microbiome has. I mean, we first have to look at that. Before we did micro, uh, fecal transplants for C. diff, I think, you know, people could argue, you know, what is it going to do and how influential is it? I think we're only starting to learn that because um, it certainly affects things like obesity. It may affect how we um, metabolize uh, drugs that we take, um, obviously food as well, inflammation. Um, in animal studies, and I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I do know that in animal studies, it has uh, influenced obesity and in some cases, tumor volume and things like that. So I think these are the kind of questions that we should be asking and we should be very open to what, you know, what we find because we're going to learn more along the way. Um, I agree with uh, Cynthia that, you know, we don't know how often, none of those studies have been done in any kind of real way, but I think it's hypothesis generating. Um, and I think we're going to learn more. We know that uh, the microbiome also is something that modifies response to immunotherapy. So it can, it can modify one's response to therapy. We know that much already. Mm -hmm. So just take it a step further. And again, the, the, when I think about fecal transplant, I always think you got to make sure that the transplanted um, you know, specimen you get is, is helpful, right? So how do we determine that also? I'm sure people are working on these things. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Josie, I have one for you. Um, this uh, ally is asking, how should someone who's had uh, several abdominal surgeries strengthen their core? 
So Ooh. I'm assuming they're talking like post-treatment. So what are some, some exercises? Well, first they should. So um, uh, one of the first important things is um, post any type of surgery is how do you reduce your scar tissue, but also how do you build back strength? And especially in the abdominal, we work a fair amount on how to move your spine in five different directions, because we talk about the spine as being your super highway to make sure that all of the different systems are going through that spine super highway. So having strong abdominal strength um, is fundamental to ensuring that you are upright um, and also, and it will reduce any kind of secondary discomfort that comes from weakening. So there's many, many activities. I mean, um, lots of people, you don't have to just go to the gym and gym and crunch because as this individual uh, request, I, uh, mentions, they might have incision sites or they might have um, secondary um, tumors or anything like that. So working with a specialist that actually understands what is going on with your body, whether that be a physical therapist or an occupational therapist or a yoga therapist to identify those issues and ways that you can bring back that strength. Um, and I would, the only thing I would add to that is, um, is that it, it's progressive. You're not going to go in and do one, one session and suddenly have cured your, any type of issue. You need to do it consistently over time and do it um, gent start, st start it with more gentle so that you feel, um, you don't hurt yourself, um, and be just mindful of any incision sites and work with your team to get the best support. Um, yeah, but there's, there's plenty you can do. You just got to do it. You have to move, right? You have to keep move. moving, stretching and, and, um, it's, it's so good for your overall body, your health, um, mental health. And if this, if this individual wants specific support on our website, we have tons of different poses and ways to spot, um, to support. Mm -hmm. However, I would just work, I would always, it's not just doing one thing, right? It's a right. comprehensive. So if you just say, Hey, I want to go and spot treat my strength in my abs. Well, if you are having other issues that might counteract any type of good. So it's a, a comprehensive approach to m your wellness plan. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Thompson. We have a question about, is it recommended to buy organic fruits and vegetables? I know a lot of cancer patients, you know, sometimes struggle to pay bills. Is, are they going to get a better health benefit from buying organic fruit and vegetables? Yeah. So, I mean, there's two issues. One is the nutrient content. And there's been a few publications that suggest there is slightly higher levels of things like vitamin C and carotenoids in, in organic produce. Um, in the scheme of eating, you know, five or eight servings a day of fruits and vegetables, does it, you know, is it highly significant? Perhaps not, but um, certainly there is a, a slight advantage in that way. Um, certainly in terms of protecting ourselves from uh, pesticides, and I think this is an area that's getting more attention now, finally. The National Cancer Institute has actually started um, a research program to more comprehensively look at some of these environmental exposures, um, not only in our, our food supply, but you know, in our environment more broadly. So we don't have the definitive studies on if I take a group of people and put them on organic, are they gonna have lower cancer rates? We'll never have that study. It would require 200,000 people for 20 years, right? So, um, so I think it's a matter of being conscientious. Cost is an issue that I think we, we want people to eat fruits and vegetables. I would say you can wash your fruits and vegetables and that's a good practice to get into. Um, and I would say that, you know, it's, it's relative, right? When I go to the grocery store, I always start in the produce department. Um, and I, that defines my budget for that trip. Um, and I just try to find things that are, you know, in a reasonable price break and increasingly organic fruits and vegetables are, and I would say, I don't want to name brand, you know, certain stores, but there are stores that um, provide much more options for organic fruits and vegetables at a much more reasonable cost. So look for those. Hey, Doc, can I ask a follow-up question to you? Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we talk about this in terms of risk of cancer, you know, in terms of colorectal, and we talked about the gut, are you aware of what kind of influence pesticides might have on, on the gut and perhaps colon cancer, colon cancer itself? Yeah, I think there, there's not a lot of definitive information. So I, I you know, I, I think intuitively, we, we would think that these things are not healthy for the gut, that they're going to cause an inflammatory response. Certainly, they're going to um, cause an immune enhancement to try and, you know, combat this exposure. Um, but, but there's very little data out there, unfortunately. And Dr. Thomas, what do you suggest for the colorectal cancer patients who can't eat their fruits and vegetables? Is there, are there supplements or something they should be taking to um, get that serving they need, but they can't really digest? Wow. I know some, some of these vegetables, we spend hours in the bathroom after eating them. So yeah, I, I think you, yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously there are, are supplements that are processed fruits and vegetables. I'm not a fan. I think you can drive up carotenoid levels with those, but you're missing out on the, the beauty of a whole fruit or vegetable, right? Um, mm -hmm. I would say a lot of times you can look at different cooking methods to see if that might help. Um, you can, you know, for example, um, sometimes just exposure to heat will break down some of the extra gas production in cruciferous vegetables, for example. Um, you can definitely consider smaller portions over time. The whole reason we're doing this SWOG study is really to try and, and garner more information about what can be done to tolerate. Juicing is another option, and many patients can get you know value from juicing. Um, and then you can consider things like adding ginger to the juice, and maybe that will help counteract some of the other exposures that are, are, are more problematic. But it's, okay. it's a hard uh, situation, and that's the, you know, the whole reason we're trying to do this national study is to really um, get, get more guidance for colon cancer patients and rectal cancer patients. Thank you for those tips. That's that's really amazing. I have one more question about um, protein. Um, how much protein do we really need in a day? Like, what should we be? Yeah. How much should and we? Others taking? might comment. I mean, I think the protein question. I would say the most important thing is you can get it from plants, right? So you you don't need to rely on animal protein. Um, and in fact, plant based proteins are less inflammatory and um, so I would promote that for one thing. The, you know, the recommended intake for most age groups is like 0.8 grams per kilo or 0.35 per pound. Um, I think it varies, right? If you're coming out of treatment, you've had acute weight loss, you're losing a lot of lean mass, then we need to talk about increasing your protein as well as resistance training and, or yoga or, you know, exercise in combination with diet to try and correct some of those um, issues. Um, you know, that as we age, we probably need more protein. They haven't, um, they haven't increased the requirement for protein with, with advanced stage much, but that's an area of active research that we're, I'm actually involved in a study right now to see if we can improve functionality, um, because both protein and resistance training are important to our function. Um, and so hopefully that gives you a certain level of guidance, but you really should talk to a registered dietitian at your institution and get some specific guidance based on where you are and what your needs are um, clinically. Thank you so much. And I loved uh, Dr. Rao talking about patients being an active participant. And um, I love at, um, at where, where you're at, Dr. Rao, you have a fantastic integrative oncology uh, department. It's true that it's never too late. I started integrative oncology after treatment. Do you suggest that as well for patients well, who are still having issues? I mean, I, I think that it depends. I, I think that, you know, a lot of times people are not aware. Um, and this is something that we all need to do a better job of every provider 
uh, who, because you know when somebody you know this better than I do when somebody gets diagnosed it's just overwhelming amount of information that you have to take in and depending on what's going on if you're stage four for example there's just so much in terms of the treatment of your cancer just to be informed let alone figure out uh, what you can do for yourself and mm -hmm. it's like anything else when you're learning something you always wish you could kind of go back and say well I, I would have done something a little bit different i didn't know all this stuff it's impossible i think we need to do a better job of orienting people when they get diagnosed and giving them the right information at the right time and our job is to make it easier for people to direct because many people are misdirected you know and they're they're anxious they, they look up stuff they talk to people etc so i think it can happen at any time i think there's a lot of benefits to doing some of these things seeing a dietitian um you know depending on what what's going on with your uh treatment you know i mean i, I think it's helpful to know what to do at all stages so many times it's helpful to get seen during treatment than after treatment because those are two separate situations um, and different needs. And a lot of times we focus on symptoms, but um, you know, once somebody is past it, then you can start figuring out how to work on more prevention and getting back to your to your best best self. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for being here today. And I think we have a few more questions I'll forward on to you. Um, and we'll get those answered for any of our allies. So thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.